five weeks continue eating. But you have to get the show on the road or you won't know, get you out at two o'clock. And that's the most important thing about a two o'clock meeting is it ends at two. It's my pleasure this morning, this afternoon now, to introduce the to introduce the new president of the California Social Welfare Archive for the coming year. This is really a man who needs no introduction because almost everyone in the room knows him personally. Maury Hamovich is the Dean Emeritus of the School of Social Work, 12 distinguished years. He's also an Emeritus Professor of the University Retired of the University as well as the School of Social Work. I uh, could talk for half an hour about his accomplishments, but since you know it, you know that he has accomplished a great deal in his time. Please welcome Dean Emeritus Maury Hamilton. that 
good ethical sensibility. Uh, he's got, uh, I think, the right vision, the right uh, notions about uh, social work and what role it should play in society. He is uh, deeply rooted in, in the values and vision of the profession, and I think one never should question uh, that, that commitment. Uh, she is, at the same time, strongly committed to interdisciplinary education. And I, that's been something that's particularly delighted me because on this campus, in the future, uh, social work will multiply its power, its influence, its contribution to the extent that it engages in, in, uh, in a very substantive interdisciplinary relations with our cognate uh, field. Uh, she's keenly interested in expert in educational technology. I think uh, uh, we would love to uh, see some improvements at the school in that, uh, in that area. Uh, she's uh, committed to uh, the school as an instrument of community service and to building bridges with uh, community agencies uh, in collaborative ways. She is a great listener, and you will find that when you, when you talk to her. Marilyn not only listens well, but she's almost frightfingly efficient at taking notes. The first time, the first time we sat down together, I mean, she was writing. I said, you know, she's not listening to me, and I, I listened, and I sort of said, you know, I sort of leaned over. She was taking down practically verbatim what we were talking about. So she's a very efficient note taker and doesn't miss a word. Um, she's a macro oriented person, and by that I don't mean macro weight wise, but macro in terms of perspective. Uh, she comes, uh, she comes uh, from a social work background, but also with a, with a joint degree in social policy and economics. Um, so it would, we would expect her to have that kind of perspective on, uh, on the world. Uh, and finally, I think she's a wonderful combination, and in this institution, above all, you need this combination of being a visionary, but also being a realist. So I give you uh, the next theme, uh, a realist and a visionary in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I, because I think uh, actually we don't have covered the areas in, that I do consider the most important and the areas where I hope to give uh, leadership to the school. I, I do want to comment on my note taking, which is that there's been such a infusion of information from the very moment that I first stepped on this campus that uh, I discovered without taking notes, I would just be super inundated. So it's my my small method for trying to keep uh, order in this, in this very exciting new universe that, that I entered here. Um, I want to say, I suppose it's now my role to welcome you, as well as you have welcomed me. Um, Reno didn't mention that um, my undergraduate degree was in history. And uh, I think I never lost my uh, sense as a, as a historian of looking at the world in the context of the past and um, in the context of understanding how significantly uh, the past shapes the questions that we have to ask today as well as the future. So. When I discovered there was such a thing as the California Social Welfare Archive, uh, and that there was a concept as alive as this concept is, with the leadership that it has at this institution, um, it said something to me about the School of Social Work at the University of Southern California. Um, it said to me that this is a very unusual place, this is a very unusual kind of activity, and it's a very unusual kind of commitment that you've all, all displayed. So I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be here, I'm honored to be part of this particular activity today, and I'm looking forward to uh, joining you at future meetings and learning more about the activities of, of the um, of, of this group and its purposes, and uh, I hope I'll be able to support you in ways that are important um, as time goes by, and I know you'll let me know how I can do that. So uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Reno, for a 
important for introduction. And um, I guess you're Dean Emeritus now too, right? Yes. Yeah, he has X Dean written on his tag. I told him we don't have X Dean. We don't have X President. A uh, once a Dean, always a Dean. But we could add something at the end. So it's Dean Emeritus. Thank you. <laughs> Now we come to a very special part of uh, our program, and that is our George Nichol uh, Award. Soon after the California Social Welfare Archive uh, was founded as an organization, it became obvious that our membership was composed of many highly skilled, very experienced professionals and volunteers. Uh, really active people who have and, and are still contributing many hours of their, their services and their time to make, to make this a better community. Uh, many of, the, uh, of these people are really unsung heroes and, and many others are very well known. And the George Nichols Award was established to acknowledge, to recognize these individuals and to acknowledge their work. Uh, it's named for the founding uh, president of the organization, and it enables us to publicly recognize um, each year just a couple of these outstanding people. So we're, we have two uh, awards today, and I'm going to ask um, Warren Cambridge to introduce our first awardee, and Mark Schwartz to introduce our second awardee. Marilyn Singh looked at me, kind of perplexed when I acceded to Monica's order not to respond to John's introduction or reference to me in your presence. But I knew I was going to be up here. <laughs> so I just want to say a word about that. Uh, that is that I, I realized this is a big responsibility. And I got big shoes to fill because John has been a terrific president and a very, very effective and loyal member of the board uh, for many years. And I, I, I'm looking forward to seeking his advice as time goes on. Thank you very much, John. I'm very pleased and honored to be asked to make the presentation to Reno Patty for his outstanding contributions to our community, our social work community. Um, Reno has been with Dean from 1980. I've got it here. From 1988 to 1997. Under his leadership, the school has continued to enjoy an excellent reputation as one of the top 10 schools for social work in the country. He has recruited excellent faculty members, productive scholars, dedicated teachers, committed to continuing to producing rather highly skilled practitioners, community organizers, and administrators, policy makers to join an already distinguished faculty. Reno has a long history with the school. He was a student in the MSW program from 1958 to 1960, where he not only earned an MSW degree, but met and married a fellow student, Nadine Winker. They are still happily married with two children and one grandchild, which proves that even then Reno knew how to make wise decisions. <laughs> In 1964, Reno returned to, uh, to enroll in a doctoral program, graduating in 1967. He then joined the faculty at the University of Washington and uh, developed a very a national reputation as a scholar with a focus on administrative theories. In 1988, he was selected by the search committee as our top choice to become the dean succeeding Bob Roberts. Fortunately for us, he agreed to accept that offer. Reno has continued to pursue his research interests productively, even with the heavy burdens of deanship. 
He has continued to lead his leadership in the role, in the, in the leadership roles in the profession, both among the dean's groups in California and nationally. He serves on editorial committees of prestigious professional organ journals. Locally, he has provided leadership in developing innovative programs linking the school to the university community as well as to the wider community. For example, he has served as an ex officio member of the Archives Association and has agreed to join the board now as a regular member. I was very happy to hear Dean Flynn commenting about how excited she is that we are on, on the map here and the kinds of things that we are doing and how she wants to support us. And Reno has done that very nicely, including Marilyn financial assistance and the smallest more that more is in. I've already extended an invitation to her to become a, an ex officio member and she has she agreed very nicely. Um, I also want to point out that Reno has received a number of uh, complimentary citations even before this very prestigious one. Um, including a uh, distinguished scholar position at Hunter College in New York, and most recently a citation from Los Angeles City Council. I could go on a greater length, but Monica will put the hook out, <laughs> so I will stop, and I am pleased to present the award to be known. Actually, 
And that was part of council. When she was there, she was part of the, the formation of the El Nido. She worked in the old LA Volunteer Bureau and then went on to the Voluntary Action Center. She uh, worked, has worked continuously off and on in the United Way. There are three or four of us who worked together throughout the years for in central Los Angeles, and Leela was one of them, and many of the time we've carpooled together to do all these things. So I can testify personally as to her activities. She became involved with a grand jury. She served on the grand jury first, and then she became involved with the grand jury association. And she worked with David Carota, who was also one of our board members who could not because of a conflict be here today. But they did a lot of formative work and started a lot of things, and she is, became his right hand at one point, I think. These are all the many things that she's done besides what she's done for us, but here we have been blessed by having her be one of us, and there is nothing like being one of us and helping whenever you're called upon and the kind of person that we knew well, we do know that when we pick up the telephone, she's not going to say no. She's always going to pull us out of the fire if we need her. It is with the greatest of pleasure, Leela, that we make this presentation today to you. I have more. 
I recruited Bruce for a position on our faculty almost 25 years ago in 1973. Is that correct, Bruce, or was it 1973? He had an AB degree from Oberlin College, a master's degree in American history from Harvard University, and a master's as well as a PhD degree from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. He seemed to be very bright and scholarly, but very young. <laughs> he still looks very young to me. Uh, and he has more than ample, and he has more than amply demonstrated the scholarliness, as well as his wisdom, his collegiality, his teaching skills, his commitment to advocating social policies designed to meet the needs of the disadvantaged members of our society. Bruce Jackson's scholarly accomplishments have included a substantial number of journal articles and books, and the books have received wide acclaim. His first two books, The Reluctant Welfare State and Social Policy, From Theory to Practice, have become classics uh, and have been used by as textbooks nation nationally uh, among schools of social work. They are in there, I guess, both of them are in their third printing, which says something about the the, his ability to predict in the future what was necessary, not just in terms of the current. His most recent work, Strategies for Teaching Social Policy Practice, is also highly regarded within the discipline. Currently, he's working on another book, tentatively titled, The Ninth Trillion Dollar Mistake, Rethinking America's prior Priorities from FDR to Clinton. And I've, over the months, I've discussed with him at different times how this was going. And it's, it's, I, I can't wait for this book to be finished so I can get to read it. It's been so exciting. In addition to his achievements in scholarly research, Bruce has been involved in local community service, including, including membership in our advisory council of this organization. On the national level, he has served as chair of the Committee on Social Policy of the Council on Social Work Education, as well as the editorial, uh, the editorial board, I'm sorry, of several scholarly journals. He too, like we know, served as a distinguished scholar and professor at Hunter College. It reminds me a little bit of when Nori Class and John Milner were teaching at Tulane University in the summers over a number of years. And they, they admired and accepted him what, what he was doing so much, the two of them, that they had honorary faculty positions. And not, they were more than honorary, weren't they? They didn't pay beyond that, but they were established <laughs> to recognize their contribution. Well, obviously, uh, this was one occasion, or one situation, where USC and California um, exported to great professors on this faculty uh, to the east. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to use a pejorative word, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> the topic of Bruce's address today is welfare reform, lessons from the past. It's not only very timely, but he is eminently qualified to address us on this very important subject. Bruce.
and uh, perhaps at the end suggest a policy option that our erstwhile president might have considered um, just recently. Ooh. At risk of simplifying, I guess you could say, uh, and by welfare, I'm really focusing on public assistance to single heads of families, mostly women. I guess you could say it really falls into four phases <clears throat> during our most recent history. The first phase is really the poorhouse phase. We're going to spend a lot of time on this. In the 19th century and the early 20th century, the options facing a woman who became the single head of household were rather grim, to say the least. <clears throat> Most women who lived alone, who were single heads of households, came to that situation until actually the 1960s by virtue of the death of their spouse, widowhood. You'd ask anybody almost up until the 1960s, who's, who is a single head of household with children? They would have said a widow. Um, so in the poorhouse regime, uh, such a woman, her husband often dying from for example, a work-related injury. Huge numbers of people died in the mines and factories um, in the early stages of industrialization. Or because of the death of her husband, medical science being in a primitive state at that point, she was destitute, turned to public authorities, and in many cases they would say to her, <clears throat> we have no choice but to separate you from your children. Uh, we'll put them in an orphanage, uh, they simply assumed uh, such a widow either was an unfit mother or simply that she couldn't support her children. Remember, this was an era when women, uh, particularly after they were married, did not work. So the assumption was, you won't work, you can't work, you shouldn't work, therefore you can't support these children, therefore let's take them from you and put them in an orphanage um, and uh, thus split up the family. Not a very appealing uh, option, but exercised frequently. So that phase one really has to do with this primitive poorhouse system uh, that carried on right up into the early part of this century. Phase two um, really lasted from, I would say, 1909, roughly, to 1960. And this was the period when we tried to construct social policy to allow these single heads of household, usually women, to, re to remain with their children, to keep the family intact. The whole purpose was not to have them work at all, just simply to keep the family intact. Mm. Uh, not just for humanitarian reasons, but even the cost. It was cheaper to do this, it turned out. So what did we develop? We developed first mother's pension. In the period 1911 to 1929, most states set up their own mother's pension program where the mother, then, now single, uh, went to public authorities on bended knees, moreover, and more or less said, I'm destitute, can you help me? If she was fortunate, she received a very modest, very meager pension, so-called. Uh, these were not given out easily. She was investigated. One can imagine, are you in a suitable home? Are you really taking good care of your children? If she was fortunate enough, if she was an immigrant or a person of color, in many cases, uh, there was a healthy amount of discrimination that went on. There were no procedural safeguards. Uh, she might be just turned down for that reason alone. If she did get assistance, it was miserly, meager assistance. So, so scanty that many of these women actually had to resort to work as they were getting the pension, even to survive. Uh, then, of course, as you all know, we invented the aid to dependent children family in 1935. What we essentially did is we federalized the mother's pension. We said, okay, Uncle Sam, in his uh, wisdom, will pay roughly half, it's very a bit state by state, of these, uh, uh, this assistance to these single mothers. Again, the intent was so she could stay at home with her kids. There was no work. Uh, intent, uh, essentially, at all. <clears throat> uh, later, of course, ADC, as it was known in 1935, became the AFDC program, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, in the early 1950s. 
Uh, all of you are familiar with this program. I don't need to talk much at, at all about it, much other than to say um, it, it established certain federal safeguards, most importantly, the entitlement. As an entitlement, it simply meant this. No mother, no single mother around the country who was eligible for this assistance could be denied on the basis of money. Uncle Sam agreed to pay whatever it cost to meet the welfare assistance of whichever women, however many in the, in the nation, sought this assistance. Aside from that and a few other protections, like a fair hearing protection and so forth, um, the federal authorities more or less turned this back to the states in terms of po basic policies of eligibility, benefit levels, and so forth and so on. And as you can imagine, the states varied enormously in what they gave to these women. States like Mississippi, uh, compared to California, uh, there was even an eight to one ratio in benefit levels. It was that incredibly striking difference. Um, but it was an entitlement. Now I will say, even at this point, there were some liberals in the New Deal who didn't like what Franklin Roosevelt was doing with regard to these categorical programs. Remember, when, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt took office, the first thing he created practically was the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. And that was a huge welfare program that did not divide people up into categories. If you were a single person, a married person, a single head of household, young, old, didn't matter what, you got assistance under the FERA, uh, which, of course, Harry Hopkins headed. So some liberals were saying, wait a minute, does this make sense to divide people up into these little categories of ADC, old age assistance, disability assistance, and so forth, as opposed to uh, Uncle Sam providing welfare assistance to anybody who needed it. And won't this, in fact, down the pike mean that there won't be a political base of support for these little teeny groups like ADC? Uh, their objections really were overruled, and we did set up the ADC program. Now, in this period, from 1909 to 1960, welfare was not politicized. It was rarely in the paper. Those changes that were made, both in the mother's pension era and the ABC era from 1909 to 1960, were incremental technical changes. Politicians didn't run for office saying, let's get rid of the welfare population or the welfare program. It was a quiet, almost um, unknown program, and it had relatively static caseload. There was not huge growth in the AFDC. Um, so that's the end. So phase two goes roughly then from 1909 to 1960. Phase three, 1962 to 1993, we can call something like the era of conflict and stalemate. <laughs> uh, the most important thing about this period, 1962 1993, is AFDC remained intact. Even though it was frequently attacked, uh, it remained intact. In fact, it's kind of amazing now that I think back on it, that it did remain in tech. Because there were uh, rather uh, incredible attacks on it. Essentially, in this era of conflict, 1962 to 1993, and stalemate, there were essentially four <coughs> factions. On the right, conservatives, uh, while they rarely said, let's get rid of AFDC, few people said, let's get rid of it. They nonetheless worked hard to make it as punitive as possible, uh, wanting lower benefits, wanting a stringent work requirement, or in some southern jurisdictions, imposing punitive uh, rules on local recipients, uh, such as a suitable home provision in Louisiana, and, and so forth and so on. So this group on the right was constantly attacking the program, constantly criticizing it. On the left, if you want to go all the way over to the other left, during this period, there were proponents, uh, sometimes uh, quiet, sometimes loud, who wanted essentially uh, to move to a new welfare structure, whether a guaranteed income or a negative income tax, or in the Nixon and Carter administration, a family assistance type plan, where in fact, in their rendition, they were almost proposing to move back to the FERA, to put all indigent persons in one category and not have them in these new subcategories. And the Minister of Income Tax people, the Family Assistance Plan people, 
I think in retrospect we can say we're on the liberal end of things, even if the unlikely person of Richard Nixon was in that camp at least momentarily. In the middle, so if you have the left, the right, the left, in the middle, the broad center of the debate is from 1962 to 1993. There were essentially two, two groups. One group said, uh, let, they both wanted uh, welfare women to work, and increasingly that became a consensus. But there, they took two different approaches. Some said, let's use transitional work training, child care assistance. Let's give that to these women, hoping they can make it into the workforce and off the roll. Uh, this was always modest in scope, poorly funded, um, and its most recent example was the 1986 Family Support Act, which led to, which had jobs program, which funded the GAIN program here in California. There was another group, uh, however, in the middle, who wanted to get women off the roll by using incentives, such as have, giving them the right, as in 1967, to keep $30 plus one-third of their earnings up to a certain level as they were working, such that working women on the roll had more resources than non-working women, thus providing them with an incentive to get off the roll. So, but either way, these two groups were in the middle saying, yes, we agree with uh, ASCC women should work, but we'll do it uh, through rather incremental uh, changes. Now, the, why do I call this the period of stalemate? Because the people on the uh, right who really wanted to make this an even more punitive program were countered by the people in the center and on the left that I've just discussed. Uh, uh, there were also court decisions. The Supreme Court made several pivotal rulings, such as uh, ruling on constitutional approval home provision in Louisiana and so forth and so on, that made it uh, impossible for local conservative folks to use blatantly unfair tactics for not providing assistance to uh, destitute women. Uh, then there was the civil rights movement, which supported um, the welfare, uh, the, the retention of AFDC, for example, the National Welfare Rights Organization. The fact that Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter in the 70s actually proposed major reforms of social uh, uh, welfare uh, tilted the debate, made, made it harder for conservatives to dominate the debate even though they played a huge role in sabotaging both of both of those plans. So for all of these reasons, AFDC remained remarkably stable, actually, between 1962 and 1993, uh, despite the attacks on it from conservatives. I must say, liberals, those who wanted something like a negative income tax or a family assistance plan, in turn were stalemated. Uh, they couldn't get what they wanted through the Congress either. Um, and uh, partly this was because Southern Democrats used their parliamentary positions in Congress, chairing all the key committees of Congress, that they sabotaged, uh, the, for example, the Family Assistance Plan. <laughs> um, so in this period of policy stalemate, I guess you could say conservatives won some of the little battles that went on. Uh, for example, um, they got the work requirements strengthened uh, and so forth. And indeed, Ronald Reagan got rid of the work incentive provisions that were written in 1967 in 1981. Simply, uh, in the ultimate legislation of 1981, they simply got rid of those. Um, but the liberals won some battles too in this period. Uh, they did get the work incentives we talked about in 1967, they were able to get some loopholes of the work requirement, um, and they did get the Family Support Act enacted in 1988, which did provide job training uh, and child care to AFTC mothers um, for a number of years. I suppose in retrospect, though, and I made, made this point earlier, uh, it's kind of amazing that AFTC did survive as intact as it did in all these years, not just because of the tax on it, but because of background, fact, realities. What changed the terms of the debate decisively and ultimately with regard to the was the fact that most married women, most women with children, 
for now working, which, as you know, began uh, gathered steam in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And in a society where most women worked, no matter practically the age of their children, it became increasingly difficult to contend that AFDC women ought not also to work. So in a way, it was just a matter of time until the shift, the debate would shift from the old days, the pre-1960 days, when uh, mothers' pensions and ADC were intended to keep working women at home. AFDC became a, what's known in politics as a wedge issue. And we have to uh, uh, credit, if that's the word, George Wallace and Ronald Reagan heavily in this process. Essentially what happened was, uh, first conservatives saw the, politicized the AFDC issue by uh, perceiving that not only was an attack on AFDC uh, acceptable to conservatives, but also to white ethnic Americans. And so the, the concept was, if we attack AFDC and do it in the uh, most direct and lurid terms, then we can bring over to the Republican Party some of those white ethnic voters who are becoming dissatisfied with liberal policies. And Ronald Reagan actually coined the term welfare queen in 1976 when he was running for the presidency. He alleged that a Chicago mother used 80 names, 30 addresses, 12 social security cards, and veterans benefits from four non-existing husbands, all leading to $80,000 in fraud. And it almost became the Willie Horton of 1976. Historians or journalists have since discovered this particular woman, in fact, had only defrauded the system by $8,000 and had used four rather than 80 aliases. But the damage was done. The term welfare queen was deeply implanted in American folklore. And from that point on, AFDC became uh, a highly politicized program. Uh, it seems hard to believe that a span 16 years earlier, uh, welfare, AFDC, was not even in the news. A lot of people didn't know about it. I thought I should confess something here, now that I'm at it. Uh, I was getting my master's degree in history, decided history wasn't for me, uh, and uh, uh, decided to enroll the University of Chicago in social work. The night before I was to go into the registration line, I was turned on a talk show on radio, and they were talking about something called AFDC. I thought, See, what is that? That must be the Americans for... Uh, I literally didn't know what the AFDC was, which is kind of a testimony to the unpoliticized nature of this program until even into the early 1960s. <clears throat> well, the fourth period, and then we're right up to the present, I told you I would go through this rapidly, uh, we could call the period of controlled devolution and disentitlement. And that's the period we're in, roughly 1994 to um, the current time. And of course, it uh, culminates in the signing by Jimmy Carter, I'm sorry, Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Problem with history. Um, of the personal responsibility, don't you love these words? The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunities Act of 1996. This devolution, all right, gives to the states remarkable powers, way more than were delegated to the states under ABC than AFDC. But it's a controlled devolution because essentially conservatives, while using the rhetoric of devolution, couldn't resist putting in some federal rules like lifetime limits um, and so forth in this uh, federal legislation. Uh, and most importantly, of course, the federal money was capped, thus ending the entitlement thus leading to the theoretical possibility, theoretical only at this point, of actual denial of assistance in some states if the bucks run out. 
I guess, occurs in many social programs, like Head Start. Um, why did this occur? How could this have occurred? Um, it's, uh, I guess you could say, recall our discussion of the conservative um, faction on the right, the liberal faction on the left, and the broad middle in the debate that occurred from 1960 to 1993. Well, what happened, to make a long story short, was the right became bolder and the center collapsed leading a left versus right conflict that where the president ultimately cast the deciding vote by putting his, uh, his signature on this legislation. The right became bolder, uh, partly because of the theorists like Charles Murray, who in numerous writings exhortiated AFDC as the cause of all the world's problems um, of, of uh, out of wedlock birth, of, the welfare culture, which he alleged to be rampant in low-income black communities. Um, and he, he essentially urged, this is outright abolition of AFDC. So the, the, the folks on the right had a, had a theory now. And of course, uh, always viewing it as a wedge issue, when the Republicans swept the Congress in 1994 uh, under the leadership of Newt Gingrich, uh, they very quickly decided to, to try to actually end the program, something they had not tried in the prior 20 years to do. Um, there was a faction in the Congress, uh, who we can call liberal, who wanted the, repro the program retained and indeed even liberalized with more work training, more child care assistance, and so forth and so on. But the pivotal person here was Bill Clinton, who, who decisively shifted the balance of, the, of the power, I guess you could say, when he ran in 1992 for the presidency, saying he wanted to end welfare as we know it, and even saying he supported life limits. Two years and you're off, he said in that campaign. Uh, first time a president had taken this stance, and by taking it as president, he shifted the whole power balance toward the right thus setting up the uh, 1996 legislation. So the fate of single mothers is now thrown back to the 50 states um, who can more or less do as they wish uh, with lifetime limits also established by the federal legislation. What lessons do I draw out of this, having marched through this uh, so rapidly? Well, five lessons. Let me, let me try this out. There are probably many, many other lessons. These are the five I, I latched on to. Some of them are very obvious ones. The first lesson, single mothers and their children have never and never will attract widespread support from the general public in this country, if history is any guide. Even when single mothers got to that position through widowhood, presumably something they didn't have much control over, unless they put arsenic in their spouse's tea. Uh, there was scant public support for this group. Extensive poll data, uh, political scientists have gone through extensive poll data, uh, including that there is a deep anti-welfare sentiment in the United States that is quite unique. Uh, he's, he's concluded, actually, it's, it's not purely just a racist, because Poll data toward African Americans, persons of color, are actually much more favorable than to this group of welfare recipients. Uh, lesson number two: This group, their vulnerability increases to the extent they are segregated into a single welfare category. Uh, as I was reading uh, recently, I came across something that I hadn't realized. That's quite fascinating. In 1939, when they developed survivor's benefits for Social Security, what they did unwittingly is they took widows out of this category. So ADC increasingly became women who had been either deserted or divorced, hence were single, or had given birth to children out of wedlock. And it's been isolated into one category, persons 
who Americans were suspicious of in any way. At least with widows, uh, it was pretty hard, at least harder to argue that, as I just said, such persons came to their singlehood by virtue of bad moral character or whatever. Um, and of course, with the creation of SSI in 1972, uh, the disabled and the elderly were given special status with federal welfare uh, and their benefits, as with widows under Social Security, went way higher than AFDC benefits in the various states. Uh, lesson number three, whether proposed by liberals or conservatives, wel welfare reform, quote unquote, has usually meant reform without significant resources. On the conservative side, they see welfare in its first place, in the first instance, as wasted money. Well, the whole welfare system to them is wasted money. So when they think of welfare reform, they think of it as stopping the waste of money, hence cutting funding, devising a plan that will cut its current funding back even further. Um, a point of view to say the least, that is not very friendly to investing in human capital. Liberals, uh, with few exceptions, to the extent they've tried to well reform welfare, have usually thought of very modest work training and child care subsidies. Um, the work training, there's a wonderful book on this by Norton Grubb, just came out from the Russell State Foundation, where he surveyed 30 years of evaluative research of work programs uh, for welfare recipients. And uh, the conclusion is rather staggering. He's decided that with perhaps one exception, none of these programs have fundamentally lifted people out of poverty or even off the welfare rolls. And all of their benefits erode within four to five years. That is, uh, welfare recipients have gotten very quick hit training programs. They're mostly quick hit training programs do not retain benefits from those quick hit training programs four or five years later. They then look just like welfare recipients who didn't get any training. Uh, so nobody really has thought of wealth reform in the context of serious human capital investment, serious remedial education, serious long-term job training. Um, it's always been in the context of cheap reform to try to get folks into the workplace. <clears throat> My fourth uh, lesson, <laughs> I got to be rather negative here, is that presidents and political elites will not invest political capital in this population if it, if it remains at a single category. Um, let me read to you two things. When I was doing research in the Lyndon Johnson archive for another project, I came across an oral history from Wilbur Cohen, the late Wilbur Cohen, uh, briefly Secretary of HEW, longtime advocate of Social Security reforms. And either he was feeling bad that day or whatever in this oral history, but he simply said this. Uh, he said, I have to admit to you, all during those eight years, he's talking about the Johnson administration, I got no real enthusiastic support from anybody in the administration with regard to welfare recipients. He's talking about AFDC in particular. And he named names. He said, Robert Ball, all he cared about was Social Security. Uh, Abraham Rubikoff, briefly Secretary of the HEW, was so disinterested in welfare, he opposed even the 1962 Service Amendment. Um, he said, um, Johnson, in 1967, didn't want to have anything to do with the work incentive program. One of those many incremental reforms, he didn't even want that. Uh, when Wilbur Mills put in the bad amendment, that is the freeze, they actually tried to get a freeze on welfare in 1967, John Gardner, then the Secretary of HEW, told Cohen to talk to Mills because he, Gardner, would never talk to Mills. Uh, saying to um, Cohen also, these people are all anti-welfare. What we got, said Cohen, in welfare was due to people like Altmaier, Jane Hoey, Ellen Winston, and Elizabeth Wickenden, 
and George Wyman of NW National Welfare Rights Organization, and people like that. Not because we had a groundswell of public opinion or an alert, alert public out there or President of the United States who made welfare uh, a priority or, or secretaries of HEW who made welfare their number one priority. This is the fault line in all of these analyses. If we flash forward to Bill Clinton, <clears throat> let me read to you a very brief excerpt from Robert Reich's book, Locked in the Cabin. Uh, just very brief. On July 31st, 1996, Rice says, he's, uh, he's in the cabinet room. Bill Clinton is meeting with the cabinet trying to figure out whether to sign the welfare reform legislation. And Rice says, about two and a half years ago, we debated B, that's Bill's, own proposal for welfare reform in this same room. The idea then was to spend $2 billion a year more than the nation was spending on welfare in order to help move welfare recipients into decent jobs. The extra money would go for job training and child care, and if there were no jobs in the private sector, the money would finance public service jobs. But that proposal didn't get far. B was focused on trying to pass health care legislation. Besides, he worried about how to justify spending $2 billion a year more on welfare when telling the public he was trying to end it. How did we come to this? B didn't stake out a firm position against the Republican welfare bill early enough to give potential allies of the House and Senate sufficient cover or adequate assurance he'd be with them if they wanted to vote against it. So the initial bill was shaped by the Republicans, and their arguments dominated the subsequent debate over it. They offered B two heinous versions, which he reluctantly vetoed, but they knew they had him cornered. And they probably knew that Morris, this is Bill Morris, uh, the pollster, Dick Morris, was fulminating about the importance of taking welfare off the table before the fall campaign so Dole couldn't be, be over the head with it. Well, I could go on to get the tone of this. Now, of course, you, if you've read Wright's book, you know he italicizes his personal thoughts occasionally, unexpressed personal thoughts. In this case, his italicized, he wanted to say, but didn't say to Bill, you're 20 points ahead in the polls, for Christ's sake. You don't need to hurt people this way. You don't need to settle for this piece of shit. Veto it and explain to the public why you did. Explain that you wanted to get poor people into jobs and, and that to do so requires money. Uh, so I rest my case on that particular lesson, the fourth lesson. One final lesson. Almost no one in welfare debate ever has or does focus on the ultimate genesis cause of welfare for so many women, and that's the inadequate vocational technical training for youth in American high schools. Women who reach age 18 without education, without skills, without, without advanced training, uh, are at risk of welfare dependency once they have children, no matter their age when they have these children, given the high rates of desertion, divorce, and out of wedlock births. Um, what could Clinton have done in conclusion? Uh, what do all these lessons suggest he might have done? Well, of course he could have simply um, insisted on retaining the FTC entitlement uh, with greater job training and child care, although I will hasten to say $2 billion additional spending is really a drop in the bucket with regard to the training needs of this and education needs of this population. Or, Drawing on these lessons of history, perhaps Bill Clinton could have reframed the issue by establishing two new entitlements. Now I'm being totally in a fantasy world, but let me state it to you anyway. Why couldn't he have said, let's pass an Endangered Workers Act? We do this, don't we, for uh, various uh, rare species. Let's make it an Endangered Workers Act. Why not give American who live under a certain economic threshold uh, and who have no more than high school education, minimally, let's say, three years lifetime entitlement to job training, vocational education, and community college education. Uh, such that when those people become unemployed, rather than going on to welfare roles, they go immediately into training. Hmm. In fact, why not make the unemployment insurance program, the point of first 
uh, impact such that when persons, including welfare recipients, single heads of households, become employed, they don't go to a welfare office, they go to the unemployment insurance office, which not only gives them, uh, which gives them immediate benefit, but then links them up to their local community college, which then orchestrates this uh, system of training that uh, they can use off and on during the rest of their lives. Um, Norton Grubb, whose book I mentioned just recently, actually wants a ladder of opportunity. The lower run, available to, to citizens, the lower run is short un, uh, interventions for unskilled people, maybe 15 to 30 weeks of job training, uh, maybe brief remedial education. Get them into the workforce. After they've been in the workforce for a while, there's a middle run where more job training, where they get into certificate programs uh, in community colleges and do get more on the job training. And then the upper run would be getting an associate degree in a community art, uh, uh, community college, and get further job training. Make this an entitlement such that these low-skilled, poorly educated women who are so numerous on the welfare rolls have an economic future. Grub concludes, the only thing that doesn't wash out, that doesn't erode over time, is a certificate or a degree, not some teeny little 15-week job training episode they've had, which has no long-term effect in lifting them out of poverty. The second entitlement would be called the Prevention of Endangered Workers Act. <laughs> and this entitlement would, uh, there's a wonderful book by Hedrick Smith, uh, looking at Japanese and German approaches to vocational education in high school. Uh, to make a very long story short, in both Japan and Germany, but particularly Germany, you come out of high school if you're not college bound with very advanced technical skills. Having interned with corporate uh, mentors and getting technical training such that you're ready to enter the workforce at more than an unskilled level. So why not guarantee to all high school students who are not college bound that kind of training? Now all of this would cost money, I realize. Uh, David Elwood, Recalled in a recent article that Clinton, in 1994, as he was developing his proposal, even for $2 billion of investment in this population, uh, couldn't find the money anywhere. Whenever to find the money, he had to cut somewhere else. To cut for more controversial, he decided in the welfare program itself. No one wanted to raise taxes. So the bigger challenge that underlies all of this has to do with American priorities. Let me give you just one example, and then I'll close. At precisely the same time that Elwood and Clinton were struggling to find $2 billion for welfare reform, the General Assistance, the General Accounting Office, the GAO, issued a report saying the F-15 fighter planes, of which we have a huge fleet, could meet all threats from foreign nations until the year 2014. Almost immediately after that, the Pentagon decided to build a fleet of F-22 to the tune of $72 billion. And this is just one of the many weapon systems they decided to build in the last couple of years. So this is the broader issue, not just uh, trying to get these folks into broader programs, but to finding resources to fund truly humane uh, programs for them. Now, I, I want you to know that I was in Bruce's first uh, semester class. Do you remember Bruce? I was his student, and uh, he got me really enthusiastic about research, and maybe you can see why. He's such a, a wonderful speaker and instructor. And I actually went into research and did that for work for quite some time because of you, Bruce. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to thank um, everyone who helped with the program today, Mara Schwartz and Leela Cohn and Bruce Britton, uh, Jim Blaine and Ed, uh, Ed Hummel. I'd like to uh, say congratulations again to our awardees. John Cully, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the entire board for a wonderful and successful year as our president. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, 